Bonjour à toutes. Bonjour. Welcome everyone. It's a bit difficult to talk in a language. You manage. Yes. Je crois qu'il donc il y a la possibilité pour vous. It's possible for you to listen to this talk in French, if you wish, and in English. And I will ask questions in English, and she will answer in uh, in English. But after all these languages that we heard, it shouldn't be a problem. I am glad to be here with you, Shimamanda, Adichie to talk about many things, and I hope of a certain number of questions that we didn't hear about during this, uh, this talk, and also of literature. And I would like to start up with languages. This was one of the rare opportunities to hear many different languages. Many of them, usually, we don't understand. And doing this experience brings up this question, what is your relationship to or with this language in which you read your text? It's not the language that you used to write the book you wrote in English, and it had to be translated in Igbo. But this language actually, I assume, structures your vision of the world, at least in part, with English on the side. So how do you apportion your vision of the world between Igbo and English for you? Um, f first of all, I just want to say how deeply moved I was by that performance. I am so grateful for it. I found it beautiful and moving, and it just reminded me of the universality of our concerns, and, and it means very much to me, just listening to this wonderful variety of women in different languages, and just having the sense that something spoke to them in that walk means so much to me. So thank you, thank you, you wonderful women who did the reading, thank you. <laughs> It's interesting you ask about the sort of how I divide, how the languages divide my worldview, but I do want to say that English is not to the side. English is very much at the center. I consider myself bilingual, equally so. And so English and Igbo have the same, um, in different ways, but really have equal emotional power for me. I grew up speaking both languages, and I consider both my first languages. I sometimes would speak both in the same sentence. Actually, I still do. And growing up, Igbo was the language of, of laughter, um, the language of emotion, the language of family. English, because I was educated entirely in English in Nigeria, and, and because Igbo was not allowed in school. I mean, it was actually, you got punished for doing something called speaking the vernacular. And, and so I think growing up there was a sense of, um, it's not so much that I had that sense of shame because I didn't, I've always been proud of, of, of my language, but I think that the, the formal structures of education in Nigeria don't do very much to teach us pride in our languages. But, but I grew up in a family that was very, very proudly Igbo. It was very important to my father that my parents, that we not just speak Igbo, but that we, that we be, um, that the Igbo norms and the Igbo worldview be part of us. So things like, um, there are obviously things I criticize in, in the book, such as um, the idea of male superiority, which of course is not limited to Igbo land. But there are wonderful things about Igbo culture. There's the sense of, um, 
sort of a, a, a can-do spirit. There's a kind of, and I think I grew up with that, and, and even the language reflects that. There's the sense that you, each person has a personal guiding spirit. So the chi in many Igbo words, which often is translated as God in the Christian sense, really isn't. It's more like a personal guiding spirit. And in Igbo cosmology, if your personal guiding spirit, um, you can bend the will of your personal guiding spirit. And I, and I kind of love that, that idea that you can, you know, you can, you can change the world, you can do it. Um, and so I, in terms of my writing, I, you know, I don't know, I, I, I don't really like, increasingly, I don't like talking about how my writing comes about. Because I want to do the writing. I don't want to psych psychoanalyze my own work. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, I'm sure Ibo, I, I don't know. What I do try to do in writing fiction is to, to create the world I know, which is a world in which people speak English and Igbo all the time, at the same time, in the same sentence. You know, sometimes people translate directly from Igbo into English. And I try, to, I, I try in writing about characters like that to capture that, which is why I throw in Igbo words in my English. And, and I know that this sometimes um, confuses or annoys editors, but it's important for me to do that because I want to capture the texture of, of the world I come from. I assume that from what you just said about the prohibition to speak Igbo at school. Igbo language is more a language, an oral language, in relation to English, both written and orally. Also, you told me some time ago that Igbo language is not spoken widely. It's not one of the most important or literary languages in Nigeria, which counts many different languages. My question is then, what is your relationship to written Igbo? Was there any schools where you lived where Igbo was taught, or was it a choice for your family to raise you and teach you only in English? Um, so just to... Igbo is, there is an Igbo literature, but it's not a wide literature, and it's not, it's really not a literature that's thriving in the way that Hausa literature is thriving in Nigeria, and Yoruba literature a little bit more than Igbo literature. Um, but growing up, I grew up in Igbo land, so I think had I grown up in, in a place like Lagos, which is sort of Nigeria's metropolitan center, maybe I would not be as grounded in igbo -ness as I am. But I grew up on a university campus in igbo land, and everybody around me spoke Igbo. You know, everybody else spoke English, but also they spoke Igbo. And so it wasn't so much, I mean, and the idea that in school um, you will get punished for speaking Igbo, but, but at the same time there was a class in Igbo, so only in Igbo class were you allowed to speak Igbo. <laughs> And so I took Igbo as a subject, which, by the way, was not cool. Um, and it's, this is one of the things I want to try and change. Because it's important for young people to consider something cool and then to embrace it, right? And, and our education system is structured in a way that just doesn't give any cool factor to our own languages, at least to Igbo, I think. And, but, but I took Igbo in school all the way until the end of secondary school. And it was a choice I made because I've always been interested in languages, but I still don't write it as well as I would like. I write it much better than most, most Igbo people, but, but it's not a language in which I can make a philosophical argument because I wasn't educated in that language. Ou un roman, ou de la fiction. Or a novel, or a fiction. You know, I have actually been thinking about it. I'm actually, well, I don't like talking about things that I'm working on, so. <laughs> I was just about to. But no, um, so I'm going to be very cryptic and coy and say that the exploration of Igbo in fiction is interesting to me. Since I have no clue about Igbo, I was wondering about gender. I don't speak many languages personally, but languages 
all have a various relationship to gender. Grammar has um, feminine, masculine. Sometimes there is a gen or neutral gender. How is it with Igbo? Is it different from English? And what is the consequence um, on seeing the seeing the world in a gendered manner? I think that's such an interesting question because I've often um, blamed the French language for many, many, many terrible things because it is so gendered. I've never understood why, you know, inanimate things. When I, I took French in school, um, I, I don't speak well, obviously, but I read better than I speak, and I remember just being struck by how everything, there was a feminine and masculine for bottles, for chairs, I'm like, what the hell, right? <laughs> but Igbo, Igbo isn't, Igbo is, um, Igbo has the same pronoun for men and women, which means that um, it's, not, it's not a language that's, that's gendered in that way. And I think it shapes the way you look at the world. So it, in reading pre-colonial Igbo history, which interests me very much because I'm, I'm deeply interested in the, in, in the way the, the Igbo world was structured before Christianity, because now everything has been colored by Christianity. And in reading about pre-colonial Igbo history, I'm struck by how the understanding of gender, as it is in the West today, was very different from, the Igbo world was not like that. I mean, obviously, men as a group still had power, all of that, but, but it was more, um, it wasn't quite as stark, it wasn't quite as, as divided, and I think the language reflects that. So if I were talking about a man or a woman, I would use the same pronoun, o, o jalafia. A person went to the market, and then you probably, if you wanted to know what the gender was, then you would have to, have to ask man or woman. And actually that, that language um, thing was eye-opening for me fairly recently when, so obviously you know I go around the world telling people they should respect women, right? Um, and, and that men and women are equal. And, and so I was talking to a dear friend of mine who I'd been to see a doctor, and she said in Igbo that she'd seen the doctor and the doctor was very good. And I then said to her, in, I switched to English because again, like I said, in, in, in my relationships with family and friends, we, we switch. So I switched to English and I said, so what did he say? And my friend laughed and said, the doctor was a woman. And I felt so ashamed <laughs> um, because I realized that even that, that idea of, of, of maleness as default is something I haven't entirely unlearned, clearly. But, but it also made me think about language because had we been speaking only Igbo, I wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't have, yeah, I wouldn't have voiced that assumption. Hello. After Igbo, let's talk about English. English for you is, is a continent as such, spoken in many different countries in the world, used as a written language in various countries in the world. The language is not the same. Accents are different. Before coming here, I was reading an article that one of your friends, an American writer, published about you, a portrait in the New York Times. And I noticed that uh, your English is quite uh, British English. And for Americans, it sounds like British English. So when you moved into the US, what happened with respect to British English? Did you realize at that moment that uh, the English that you spoke was more British than American? And what is your relationship to this difference now? Yes, I realized it was different. It's, it's very easy to realize it's different when Americans, um, Americans seem incapable of pronouncing the letter T. <laughs> and so it didn't take very long for me to feel very disoriented by people saying, water, <laughs> um, um, 20. And I'm thinking, no, it's 20. But 
<laughs> but I, I should say that when I first went to the US, I, I was young, I was impressionable, I wanted to fit in, and so I started to, to do an American accent, which I learned from watching American television. And I actually did it very well for maybe two years. And then I stopped because it was exhausting. It was exhausting to, to constantly have to speak outside of what was my natural register. It takes so much more effort for me to say water than it is to say water. And I remember thinking I'm going to save that energy and use it for something more worthwhile like writing. <laughs> and, um, but you know, growing up, so I, I grew up on a university campus where obviously speaking well was important. And I had a teacher, and I kind of fictionalized this a bit in, in my novel Americana. I had a teacher, Mr. Abu, and I was in the debate society, and we would have these debate meetings, and Mr. Abu would bring a radio in, turn on the BBC, um, turn to the BBC News, and tell us to listen and make sure we sounded like that. And so, in the way that I think all humans have a public voice and a private voice, my public voice is that Mr. Abu voice. So every time I'm, I'm in a public space, I remember those meetings with Mr. Abu in secondary school, and I speak that way. L'anglais de la reine. The queen's English. Yes, but it's also, it's a Nigerian queen. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I mean, when I, <laughs> I think when, when I'm in England, English people know it's not that. But, but also it's, <laughs> it's a Nigerian queen's English, but, I do have to say that in my private, my private self, um, I guess it depends. I speak different Englishes. So when I'm talking to people, if I go to get my hair braided in Nigeria, this is the way I'll be talking to the woman so that she'll understand what I'm saying. You know? um, <laughs> if I'm talking to family and friends, there's a kind of more sort of, ah, ah, is that what the man said? Imagine the man, it's not for us to slap him. Right. So, it, <laughs> but, but of course my, my, my public English is Mr. Abu, I have to sort of remember Mr. Abu in debate society. But, <laughs> but, but I think of, because English is mine, I mean I do feel that I own English. And it's both a practical um, position because I grew up in this world that spoke English, I read books only in English, but it's also a political position because there's a part of me that feels deeply resentful of the fact that you know, people invade your continent, colonize it, create countries, impose all kinds of things, um, practice a dictatorship, because that's what colonialism was. And then years later, they turn around in surprise and tell you, oh, you speak English, why don't you speak your language? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so to me, it's, it's mine, you know, and I, and I really do think that Africans have taken ownership. Anglophone Africans have taken ownership of English. Francophone Africans have taken ownership of French. We've done things with it, but it's ours. It's, it's ours. <laughs> Maybe it's a misleading impression, but we have the feeling that when moving in the literature, in French literature, it's less easy for French-speaking authors in Africa, for example, than for English-speaking authors in Africa. That English language is more supple, can be transformed, reinvented in relation to French, which is being kept by um, French academies, ensuring that rules are respected. Well, that's my impression. How do you see? What's your take on that? Um, I, I've always found it very interesting that there is that it's um, Académie Française, right? So do people sit around the table and say, we will not allow that word in? <laughs> I mean, there, there is something both amusing, but also almost admirable about it, because you have to deeply love a language to want to protect it from what is a no the normal cause that languages take. I think you're right, though. I think, I think it's easier for, for Africans who are writing in English. But I think that's a consequence of the, the power that English has in the world. I think that if we, if we went back 100 years, maybe 150, 
French had that position, where French was, was the, had, had global power. So Russians spoke French because they wanted to, that, that was what you spoke to show that you were um, civilized. <laughs> Strangely. But um, I, <laughs> I did promise to behave myself today, so I'll try. So, you know, I, I suppose my point is I'm not sure how convinced I am that it's, it's because of the suppleness of English. I think that if, if, if France suddenly ascended to the, the global position of power that it, it um, occupied 150 years ago, which I don't think is going to happen, but this is all just hypothetical, my sense is that people who wrote in French would find it easier to, um, to publish. Being an English speaker, I'm often aware of the, of the privilege of it, you know, the way that it's, it's such a global thing, the way that there's so much translation that happens when you write in English, and less so when you write in other languages like French. And, you know, I'm kind of a happy beneficiary, but also I find it a little bit troubling that English has that kind of power. I, mean, I, I remember going to Tokyo, and, and at the, 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 um, the train station, there were signs in English. And then the one train station when there were no signs in English, I remember feeling a little offended. I thought, wait, there's no... And then I said to myself, you idiot, of course, the, I mean, why should there be English? It's Japan, it's not, it's not English speaking. But it made me re realize how to be an English speaker is to take for granted that English is somehow the language of the world. And it isn't. Vous avez parlé you spoke about your Englishes, your various English languages that you speak, and I wanted to know how you play as a writer with these different English languages in your work, with those various voices. Yesterday, I had a, a public talk um, in a, as a tribute to Bernard Hofner, a translator who had just translated recently the works of Mark Twain in French. And yesterday, we heard an excerpt of Huckleberry Finn, in which Twain plays with various oralities, various accents. On the way down the Mississippi. So my question is, some writers love to work around those different music, musicalities. Is it also your case? I think so. I like language. I'm a writer who's interested in language. And, and, I, and I also occupy a world that is um, multifaceted in terms of language. Now, I think Twain is an extreme example. I'm actually fascinated about but the translator must have a very difficult time translating Twain. But, um, and I, I sometimes, I mean, writing, writing in a way to mimic sound, I think is interesting up to a point, and then it becomes tedious. And so the, the writers, the example American writers who make the choice to write particularly black characters, to write their language in a certain kind of, um, more like the sound, you know. Sometimes it worries me because I think, well, now we're being selective about how people sound, because even, even an Anglo-American, waspy American, also has an accent, you know. But in, in my own work, I, what I try to do is, so I, I will often have bits of Igbo in there, I will have bits of Pidgin English, because that's really, what I think is closest to a lingua franca that Nigeria has. Um, but, but I also, I mean, it's, it's always a balancing act. I mean, I don't, yes, back again to talking about my own work. And the thing about questions like this is, I'm really just inventing an answer for you because <laughs> when I'm working on, when I'm working, when I'm writing fiction, it's such a, it's not an entirely conscious thing. I mean, obviously some things are conscious and but there's something magical about fiction writing and, and about inhabiting a world of characters and trying to make it come alive, that, that only until you're done can you look back and think about, oh, what choices did I make and why? So I, I really don't know is the, is, the, is the most honest answer to your question. 
another way to answer the question would be to remember, if I'm not mistaken, that one of the first books you published were about poetry, were poetry. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I just, I'm going to admit to it, but as long as nobody goes to look for that book. <laughs> terrible, terrible poems. But you're right, though, I started, <laughs> I, yes, I did write what I thought were poems when I was younger. And, <laughs> and I guess it goes back, and when I'm writing fiction, the, the thing that I think is consistent in, in my, my writing process is that I read poetry. I read much more poetry when I'm writing fiction than I read fiction. Partly because I find, and I read poetry in some ways in the same way that I listen to music, which I don't do very often, music. But poetry, I want the language to wash over me. I, 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 don't, need to, um, I don't need to try and decipher what the poem is about. I just want to hear the language. And I do that a lot when I write fiction. And, I like to think that it feeds my own language. And, and in editing, I read, I read aloud. I read my, my work aloud to myself. I like to hear it. And, um, but, but again, I'm not even sure what I'm looking for. It's almost intuitive. In reading, in reading it to myself, I can tell when it, it's not right. But I, I couldn't tell you why. But I just know it's not right. Quel type de, de poésie? What kind of poetry do you read? Any authors that you like? Any periods? Um, I read a lot of contemporary poetry. I, I don't. Any po most poetry that um, my general rule is, if it has the word "o," oh, it's not my thing. Do you know what I mean? So the sort of old-fashioned poetry that will be "oh thou." I, I, <laughs> I read a lot of contemporary poetry, but also sort of I'll go from. I mean, I, I like Elizabeth Bishop. Um, the contemporary, actually, the, I'm reading right now a book by an African-American poet called Terence Hayes. He's just sublime. Um, I deeply love um, Derek Walcott's poetry because also I, I love that he, he does a lot of language. There's just, there's, uh, as a reader, I'm not drawn to poems that are sparse because I like, I like a lot of words on the page. Right? So I'm, I'm very drawn to that. But you know, I'll, I'll pretty much read any kind of poem, but the ones that I will go back to over and over, I'm Derek Walcott, I like Terence Hayes. Um, uh, the, uh, see, every time I'm asked, I forget. Can I tell you the ones I don't like? No, I'm kidding. Um, I do like Auden. Um, T.S. Eliot, not so much. Um, I, I, I just, I find his work to be cold. Um, see, I'm blank. And then I'm going to go off the stage and remember all the poets I, sh I could have talked about. Yeah. And you share with the, the British people the idea that poetry would be a literary genre, a superior literary genre. I've always been struck by the fact that uh, the authors that I met um, would say, oh, I would love to have been a poet. For them, poetry was uh, godly. In France, poetry is now um, less is a minor genre. I, may I suggest why that is? Is it because the French just like to talk too much? So, <laughs> and because. There's, a, there's, you know, a lot of philosophy, and, and because poetry, poetry requires a certain discipline, I think. But, you know, it, it's interesting that you say that. I hadn't thought about that, that idea that it's, it's, it's not even so much that I think poetry is superior. It's that, just technically speaking, I think poetry is, um, I think you can learn as a writer, any kind of writer, I think you can learn from poetry in a way that I don't think you can say that for any other um, genre. I think a non-fiction writer can learn discipline, language, form from poetry. A fiction writer can do that. A, a, a dramatist can do that. And so I don't really wish I were a poet. I wish I wrote good poems. 
<laughs> but I'm happy being a fiction writer, so I don't necessarily think that poetry is superior, but I think poetry is a very good form, and I find it to be um, a format that I admire. But also, I think it's very easy to, to not do poetry well. This is the other thing. <laughs> Alors, nous avons glissé progressivement de la question. Well, we shifted from the question of gender to literary genre. I bet. Something was misunderstood. We shifted from the genders to literary genre. And I would like you to explain your relationship to other genres. You left aside poetry to write um, novels and short novels, even though short novels were written somehow after novels. But I wanted to know what is your relationship to those two um, kinds of writing, novels, short novels, and non-fiction. And in particular, those short texts, which uh, like the one that we heard today. Um, maybe, so, do you mean short stories? Not short. On, on, no, on peut commencer par parler des nouvelles. We can start with talking about novels and the format of, we can start with talking about short novels. If we compare it with the situation in, in France, there are very few writers writing short novels, but the English speaking world, it is maybe less intimidating to start with short novels. So what is your experience? Um, I'm really still confused. So short, I don't think I write short novels. I think Americana is... No, short stories. Short stories, all oh, right. Go, so, okay. So, because yeah, there is a translation okay, problem. Okay, yeah. Okay. Short stories. Um, yeah, short stories are... They've been very important to me. I started to write short stories when I went to the U.S., actually. So before the U.S. in Nigeria, I had published a play, I had published poetry. I had, um, I had written what I called novels. But when I came to the U.S., I realized that the short story was a form that was supposed to get you into the, I guess, publishing world. And um, that most publishers wanted to see that you had written a short story if you were looking to, to sell a novel. There's a revolution happening at the back. Oh, I think they, I think they want to talk about the book. The question was also about short essays, actually, not oh, short is stories. It, is that clear oh, now? Like short oh, essays. Okay. essays. Like the one, that, like Dear Jewelry. Oh, right, okay. So, short. <laughs> I, it, it's the, 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 person, the person who writes fiction is very different from the person who writes nonfiction. I, when I'm writing fiction, I occupy an entirely different emotional place. I am. I am transported, I'm very happy when it's going well. I, I feel that my ancestors are speaking to me, honestly. Um, but when I'm writing nonfiction, I'm a lot more grounded. I know what I'm doing. I know that I want to communicate something in particular. I'm very careful about being lucid. And so when I was writing D.A. Jawelet, for example, it was very different from writing my novels because I, I wanted to send a message about D.A. Well, it came from passion, it came from, from feeling very strongly about it, but it was also quite clear-eyed. You know, I wasn't transported or particularly happy, quite frankly, when I was writing it. And, and so my, it, I find it a very, really different, really different things, non-fiction and fiction, really different, just even in the conception. Et même différent du point de vue and even de la different ces, ces textes with respect nés, to the way those texts si were born. Because if we take your first féministe, feminist manifesto, it was born from a TED conference, so a very short format of speaking. 
which you decided thereafter to publish in the form of a text. But at first, this text was um, a public talk. Today, it was not the first kind um, of, of text, but at first it was a, a private intervention, and then you decided to, to change the text and to make it an intervention. So in the very birth of the text, there is a difference. Yes, yes, absolutely. Fiction comes from, I don't know, you know, I, I, a story calls me. So, but, but my non-fiction, in particular my writing about gender, comes from, it just comes from feeling very strongly about things. And, and often it's quite specific. So my, the first one, we should all be feminists. I had been asked to give this TED talk. I didn't know what else to talk about because I had already given another TED talk years before. And, and, I, and, and this TED talk was being organized by my friend. And he said to me, we need you to come. And I said, I have nothing to talk about. And he said, well, okay, but there is the one thing you're always lecturing us about. And I, until then, I honestly did not know that among my friends, I was known as the person who would lecture them about women's rights. And so I said, wait, what do I lecture you about? And he said, women. So then I said, okay, I'll, I'll talk about it. And, and it was a kind of, um, I remember thinking nobody will care because it was a, it was a huge, um, hall full of, of Africans, and I was talking about feminism. It just doesn't really go well together. Quite frankly, I think feminism is still a word that um, we're trying, I think, we're trying to take it back. We're trying to own it, but it's still a word that brings about a lot of hostility everywhere in the world. And to make the choice to be publicly feminist, I knew had consequences. Um, but I gave the talk anyway because I felt strongly about it. And, and later when it kind of took off, I was surprised. I mean, I was happy, but I was surprised. And it was things like a friend of mine telling me in Lagos that her friends, um, that a bunch of men in her office were watching it at work and talking about it. And I thought, really? And that made me happy, particularly because she said there was a divide between the men. So some of the men were like, yes, she's right, we're feminists. And the other men were like, this is nonsense. But at least a conversation was happening. And with this one, um, Dear Jawale, I, I wrote it years before for a friend of mine, a shorter version of it. And then I had read some pieces online about Nigerians having an argument about how a woman has to cook. And I just was so sad because I thought, come on. I mean, it felt so retrograde. And so I decided to make it longer and to put it out on Facebook because that came from, I was just really annoyed. I just thought we need to in some ways, I wanted to map up my own feminism, what it is to me, how I define it. But I hope that I would also help, particularly young women, map out their own feminism so that it, it would be more difficult for a man to say to them, oh, since you say you're a feminist, therefore you're un African, which is a kind of nonsense I get sometimes. And so I hoped, I wanted it to be like a practical thing. I did, I, I'm not interested in feminist theory. I'm not interested in gender theory. I'm interested in the practical, pragmatic, useful, and maybe incremental ways that we can start to make changes. And I think often it, it can take simply giving a woman the emotional um, strength to believe that she can, because she can, you know, but, but the world has told you you can't endlessly. And so that's really what it was for me, because I wanted it to be like a practical, thing. <laughs> and, and I hadn't quite thought about publishing it as a book. I wanted it to just be read widely. And then I realized, yeah, doing a book would probably not be a bad idea, which I then did. And so, in a way, your status has changed a bit, you shifted from the status of a, a novelist to that of, as we say in French, intellectual, an intellectual person. You say yourself that you're not an expert in feminism, you just said that you haven't really learned feminist theory. But this is exactly what we call in France the figure of the intellectual, 
on the basis of a legitimacy coming from the work, the artistic work. You, as a novelist, you take, you speak out on these political issues. And I think it was interesting to also go through literature to study that question because there are no two different Shimamanda, one writing and another one speaking about feminism. There is there a sort of articulation that we need to understand. All right, I, I think I missed something in the translation. What, did you say that there are two Chimamandas or no. there are not? Oh, oh I no, see. I said the opposite. Oh. Oh, I, okay. I said you're just one person. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and oh I, just, I just have different head wraps. So some days I put on my feminism head wrap and then I'm feminist and other days I do my novelist head wrap and then I'm a novelist. No. All right, that joke didn't work out too well. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, not, it, it's not remarkable to me. Right. I think that um, I think people are different things. I do think that it's often women who are expected to be single things. So there's a sense in which women are expected to be one thing or the other thing, rather than one thing and the other thing. And so it, it, it doesn't even feel in any way conflicting to me. I've I've been feminist since I was I was old enough to observe the world. I was feminist long before I knew what the word feminist was, which is to say that as a child, I was very aware and very alert to the nuances of how men and women were treated differently, boys and girls were treated differently. I was very alert to it. And it wasn't for me so much the difference as it was that the difference had meaning. If it were simply different but equal, it would have been fine, but it wasn't. And I was very much aware of that as a child. And I was the child who asked questions. You know, you were in my ancestral hometown and, the, and it, it was fun for children because the masquerades would come out and all the children would run out to look at them. And then suddenly the, the really interesting masquerades, the ones that were supposed to have the most um, evil medicine, the ones that could turn you into a snake, that kind of thing, they would then, they would be about to come out and then some adult would say, all right, all the girls go inside. And I would think, wait, hold on, I, I want to see <laughs> the cool masquerade. And they'd be like, you can't because you're a girl. And so things like that stayed with me. Um, so, but at the same time, I was, a, I was a child who loved to read. I was a child who loved to write. And, and I was all of those things. And, and they don't necessarily seem conflicting to me. And I think there's also a literary tradition of people who, um, obviously, I don't think all writers have to take positions, right? But, but there is a tradition of writers who, who do take political positions and, and stand up for things and, and continue to be writers. And in, and in Nigeria, there's, I mean, the, in some ways, it's almost as if for African writers, especially in the 1960s, and sort of when, when colonialism was still something very present, it, it was actually almost um, the exception for writers not to take political positions, you know. And, and even just looking at the U.S., and I think Susan Sontag was one of those writers who stood up and took positions and, and still remained a literary figure, in a way. It, it's a bit strange for me, though, because I didn't quite plan this. This was not quite the plan. I didn't plan to become a feminist voice. And I'm still, I still feel ambivalent about it sometimes. But I'm also, I feel very happy to have the opportunity to, to talk about what I really care about. My fiction is my first love, and that is a thing that cannot change. I, the, the thing that I most want to do is to write fiction. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to, that all these lovely people came out. But there's still a part of me that would rather be in my study at home, wearing pajamas and trying to write a good sentence. <laughs> But, but then my second love <laughs> is my passion for feminism um, and, and just wanting to change the world. I think there's just a deep, deep down, there's just a part of me that wants, that wants justice, that wants peace. I really do want everyone to be happy <laughs> right? and well and thrive and all of that. And, but, I, but I think that for us to get there, we have to have difficult conversations and I'm willing to have those conversations. Je, je, 
I was not opposing the fact to be a feminist and to be a writer, but the choice, which you say is not really a choice, in fact, to become a public feminist, and so to spend part of your time to speak out those ideas, sometimes spending less time to write your novels. Some writers are afraid that uh, their literary work may be interpreted as political work. You, in fact, you're not afraid of working on both fronts. No, I'm not, not at all. And, and I, I would resist it very much if my work, if my fiction were read only politically. But I think that's actually something that that many writers who are from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, that's a risk that they run, that's a risk they have simply by being from these places, that there's a tendency to read our work as anthropology or as politics, rather than really as a story of human beings. I remember my first novel, Purple Hibiscus, when it came out in the US, and, and there's a father figure who is um, abusive, and so many people kept saying to me, this father figure really represents Nigeria and Nigerian dictatorship. And I thought, no, he's just a really nasty man. He doesn't represent anything. But I was struck by that because there was a sense in which it was impossible to, to, to have a kind of entry into my work unless it was seen in political terms. But at the same time, that fear doesn't stop me from, in fact, taking political positions. Because I have, you know, I, and I think it's impossible to live in the world as an engaged, present citizen and not have political positions. <laughs> when people say, oh, I take a shy away from politics, I just think, well, but how can you? <laughs> because, um, yeah, because there, there, there are many things that need to change. And, and I just feel like, yeah, we, we should all bloody well have political positions. Votre premier roman, justement, Un peuple hibiscus. Your first, ro your first novel, The Purple Hibiscus, is a novel set during the war in Biafra. Maybe you could say a word on this novel. Because this is a festival on human rights, and it was a moment in the 60s which was crucial for the creation of a humanitarian movement. It was the occasion to create organ humanitarian organizations. And I would like you to explain what got you to, to take this um, setting as um, the basis for your first novel. So it's half of a yellow sun, my second novel. It's half of a yellow sun, no problem. So half of a yellow sun, my second novel. Um, it came from wanting to understand my family's history and then also wanting to understand my country's history. So my, my family was deeply affected by the war. My, both my grandfathers died in that war. and. And I think it, it, it shaped the path my family took because I often wondered, had my grandparents not died, you know, what, what would our lives have been like? My grandfather was, was so important to my father. And so I grew up hearing a lot about my grandfather. And my father is 86 years old, but he still talks about his father every other day. He still refers to his father, he still. And so my grandfather was very present as a memory. And I think there was a part of me that wanted to understand what had taken him from us this war, and to understand the things that my parents talked about sometimes. My mother would say, um, I had this before the war. So there was a kind of a break. There was before the war, and then there was after the war. And I wanted to try and understand it, so I started reading everything I could find. And I think Biafra then became this international thing where photographers made their mark, <laughs> um, their careers by taking pictures, and um, international aid became a thing, and Doctors Without Borders was founded because of Biafra. And, but for me, it's never been that. It's been much more personal. It's been, it's been that conflict that, that took my grandfathers, that 
robbed my father of his innocence, really, my father and his generation of, of Igbo people. And also the thing that's still very present in Nigeria today, because it's still quite contested. I mean, people still, sometimes even the facts are contested. But, but I think what's changed is that now there's a bit more of a conversation about that period, which, which wasn't happening 20 years ago. And I think my novel, Half of Yellow Sun, contributed to that conversation because people could talk about difficult things if they were talking about it in terms of fiction. You've had many times the opportunity to say that one of the great references in literature in Nigeria for you was Ashibe, and we can think also that you read very early another author that we knew after his Nobel Prize, Suminka, known by uh, a greater audience on the occasion of this Nobel Prize. Was there for you important feminine or female figures in Nigeria or in Africa generally that struck you while you were a teenager? Yes. Um, Florent Wapa, who was an, an Igbo writer, who wrote very short novels, but whose um, work was about Igbo women and their lives, I was drawn to um, very much. Flora Wapa didn't have the kind of regard that I think she might have had had she not been a woman writing about women at the time that she was writing. Um, Ama Ateidu, who is Ghanaian, a bit later I discovered her, maybe sort of late, so maybe like 16, 17. I just really love her. Um, she's, 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 she's the kind of, she's, my kind of feminist. She, she occupies her space in the world. She does what she wants to do. She, she writes about women in all of their complexity. She has a sense of humor. She, and she walked for a while as Minister of Education in Ghana and then left because she just couldn't do it anymore. And just a really remarkable woman. And when I first read um, her little book called Our Sister Killjoy, even the title, <laughs> Our Sister Killjoy, I loved it, and she's a very important writer to me uh, today. So I think it was Flora Mwapa Amate do um, Buchi Emechata, I read earlier, and she's also a Nigerian Igbo writer. And, um, and I, was, I, I, I really liked her novels because they, again, they recognized women. I mean, there's something about reading, and, and I loved Achebe, and I love showing Kaz, um, particularly showing Kaz memoirs. But, but in a lot of the writing by, by African men, and it's not that I expect men to write about women, because you know, that can be a disaster too, but it's that you occupy a fictional world and you can tell which writer recognizes the humanity of women. You can tell which writer for whom women are really just objects. And, and when, you, when, you, when you go into a fictional world in which women are real, there's something about it that's very affirming. And so I felt that about Flora Wapa in particular, because her world was entirely, almost entirely female. And also I loved, I mean, Amate do, but also I loved that it wasn't, these women didn't write, they didn't romanticize women. You know, the women were human. So women did terrible things and good things. You know, women, and, and that I loved. I loved that very much. Come on. Is there a difference in a relationship that you have with your female or masculine characters? <laughs> I like my girls. No. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. I, when I wrote Half of a Yellow Sun, for example, and, and for me the heart of that novel is the houseboy Ubu. And in thinking about it, Ugu is really me. I mean, Ugu is, is the character who is least like me on the, on the surface. Ugu is male, Ugu grew up without an education, Ugu grew up in a rural village, all of the things that did, I, didn't happen to me. But Ugu is me in his 
in his world view, in his, in his, in his curiosity about the world, in his wanting to know and wanting to do better. And a lot of those things are me. And, and when I was thinking about it, I thought, you know, Ugu really is me. And I don't think I felt, I felt a deep connection to Ugu because Ugu was me. But, but I think that there are male, when I was writing the white English character, at first I had a very difficult time because I was very much aware that I was writing a white English man. And I, I think I then took on a kind of pastiche of um, Henry James. I made my sentences very um, unnecessarily lavish and convoluted. You know, so, so the whole time I was writing the early stages of Richard, what I was really doing was just copying um, Henry James. And then at some point I realized it was not coming naturally to me. It was getting very difficult to do because that was not my voice. And what I, what I said to myself was, Richard is white, he's male, he's English, but Richard is me, really. Richard is the part of me that, um, that wants community, that feels that that love is important, that, that wants to belong, that a sense of, for whom a sense of belonging is important. Those things matter to me. Richard didn't have them. And so just putting that in my head, it was easy to write Richard. This is the magic of fiction, the ability to live this experience in Richard literature that you do not have in nonfiction, to think this kind of thing, to to be in the skin of a character. Yes. Which, is, which is the magical thing about fiction. And, but, but I do have to say that for Richard and also for Ugu, I did a lot of research. I talked to many, many Englishmen, um, particularly older Englishmen, because I wanted to get a sense of, of Richard's life. And so details like what would he have eaten being from you know, upper middle class English family. Um, what was his school like? So I talked to, to Englishmen who told me all the stories and, I, and, and they kind of informed the character, right? But emotionally, Richard was me, but everything else obviously wasn't. Une dernière question. One last question before handing over to the audience for a few questions. In the letter, which was read in all those languages a few minutes ago, you say that um, you've just had yourself a baby girl and that you will endeavor to implement all those pieces of advice that you give to your friend. Time has passed since then. How do you think uh, you did afterwards in practical terms? Very well. <laughs> Well, <laughs> no, I have to say she's she's still too young, so I can't, she's two and a half, so I can't um, I can't quite pat myself on the back yet, but I'm happy to announce that she seems to be her own person. Sometimes that terrifies even me, and she has no interest in dolls, which makes me happy. I have to say, she likes making things, which makes me really happy because my plan is. By the time she's 10, I need her to change my car tires when they go down. <laughs> so I kind of want her to have practical skills, all the skills that I don't have because I wasn't raised to have them. And I find that very limiting. And um, yeah, but I think we're doing well. And, and I think that she sees that gender roles, she does not see gender roles practiced in our house. So she doesn't see that being a woman means I do the housework and do the cooking. She sees that either person can. and I. And I think it's kind of good for her. Um, and yeah, so I, and yeah. But also, you know, she's my daughter, I adore her. So maybe I can't see anything going wrong because I'm blinded by love. Oui, alors j'imagine. So there will be a microphone circulating in the room. I see a few hands up. You can see the people are willing to, to talk.
Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Adichie, for being here. I've loved all your books, but I wanted to ask you a question about Americana uh, that we have not touched upon until uh, now. In that book, you give us the impression that the character, maybe it's more than an impression, really discovers to be black when she goes uh, to the US. Because when she is in Nigeria, this feeling is not there. She, she's just like everybody else. We have today, <coughs> sorry, we have today in Europe what everybody calls a migration crisis. And we have uh, many people coming from Africa, finding themselves in society where being black is still being different. Um, I would love to hear your opinion on what does it mean today to be a black person in Europe or in another country, especially when you are a migrant. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I, um, I was just thinking about language and thinking about you said societies where being black is different, but it's more than just being different. It's so that different has many, many negative stereotypes and connotations attached to it. Because for me, difference is not a problem, right? I think it's wonderful that we live in a world of just glorious difference. The problem is when we start to attach meaning to difference and value to it. I, I wasn't black when I came, I wasn't black until I came to the US. That's, that's how I think of it. And I think thinking about blackness in Europe, there, I think there are many black people here who probably will talk about it better than I can because I've never really, I've never lived in Europe. In the US, I discovered I was black, and in Nigeria I had thought about myself as Igbo, because this is my ethnic group, as Christian, because in Nigeria religion is a major identifying thing for us. And then I went to the US and I realized that my Igbo-ness was irrelevant, so was my religion. What really was relevant was the color of my skin. And I also realized that it wasn't so much that people saw me and saw black, that black meant something in America. And, and that realization came in subtle ways often, because the thing about racism is that I, I, the manifestation of racism has changed, but the language in which we talk about it and try to understand it hasn't changed. And I think that there are people who think that unless you've been called nigger, then you haven't experienced racism. <laughs> but nobody really, I mean, it's now really fringe to sort of, you know, call people nigger. I mean, it's, it's really not how racism manifests itself anymore. And I remember being in a class and writing the best essay and my professor being surprised by that. And it was the first, it was sort of two weeks into class. He brought the essays in and he said, who is, and he called my last name. And, and when I raised my hand, he looked surprised. And I realized that the only reason he looked surprised was because I was black. He hadn't expected the person who wrote that essay to be black. And it was a, it was a moment for me that I will never forget. Because I thought, oh, so that's what it means in this country. And you know, remember I was coming from Nigeria where black achievement is ordinary. Where power is, in, is black, right? Where, um, so, so the idea of achievement was not, was not racial in Nigeria. But in the US it was, and I would walk into a store and you could tell that people were looking at you in a different way and you could tell. And it's something I came to learn because when I first went, I didn't really get it. When people would, would say um, certain things and then somebody would say, oh, that's so offensive, I would be puzzled. So I'd be like, I, I don't really understand why this is offensive. But the longer you stay in a country that is racialized as a black person, the more you start to get it, right? And so I, I I mean, sort of a, a kind of simple way for me to make the distinction is that if, if you're a black person living in the US, and I would say also living in Europe, if you walk into a store, and I'm just using this as an example, and somebody is very rude to you, or somebody doesn't attend to you, you're thinking it might be because that person is having a bad day, right? because we all have bad days and we all, you know. Or that person is an asshole, some people are, but if you're black, there's a third option, which is that person doesn't like black people or that person is racist. If you're a white person and that happens to you, you're thinking the person is having a bad day, the person is an asshole, you, race is not an option. 
and I think that's, that's really in a very sort of simple and subtle way the difference. It's that, it's that race becomes a present thing all the time. And sometimes you're not sure when it is race and when it isn't. But the, but the point is that the possibility of it being race is always there and it's an exhausting thing to deal with. And so sometimes for me, when I get off the plane in Lagos, it's so refreshing not to have to think race, you know? Um, of course, I'm thinking other things, right? So in Nigeria, there are other things to be very angry about. <laughs> um, but, but, it, but race is not one of them. And living in a racialized place means that I walk into a, a, in the US everywhere, I walk in and I immediately know how many black people are in the room. Because you need to know who has your back in case something goes wrong. <laughs> And, and it also means that I, you know, it also means that, um, I mean, you're, you're just alert to subtleties, right? And, and it's even more interesting the way that race and class are intertwined. I mean, race and gender, let's not even, don't even get me started. Race and class is even more interesting because, um, so I happen to be privileged when it comes to class, but often the, the, the assumption in the US is that if you're black, not only are you unintelligent, but you're poor. And I cannot tell you how many times at the airport I'm walking to board a flight because, because of my privilege. I often, I'm in the fancy class. But I get in the line and they always tell me, no, madam, this way. They don't look at my phone. They, don't, they just assume looking at me, you cannot possibly be in that line. It happens all the time. It happened in, it happened in Paris um, the last time I was there. This woman, who by the way was a black woman, because we all absorb racist ideas. So I'm walking to the line and she just says, madam, this way. And I said, but you haven't looked at my thing. I am, in fact, in first class. And she said, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Because in her thinking, black people shouldn't be in those spaces, right? And, and I think there is something about it that we absorb all of those ideas because we live in a society that's racialized. And, and I think it affects the way we deal with people, which is why black people have very different experiences when they go to job interviews. It doesn't matter how qualified they are. What the interviewer is seeing is a black face and their assumptions that are made. And, I mean, how to combat this is what I keep thinking about. And, um, and you know, increasingly, I don't think it's to have diversity meetings. I think, <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> I think they're well-meaning, but I, I'm not sure how effective they are because, because the diversity meetings start with a lie. The, the lie is that somehow we're all the same and we're all kind of colorblind, but that's not true. So I kind of feel that maybe the way to deal with it is to first acknowledge difference, right? To acknowledge, you know, I will need a different foundation shade from you, and that's fine. But then we, we, the thing to do is to, to ask why we attach certain meanings and value to different skin tones and, and to question that and to try and undo that. I think it's very difficult. I think, I think what's happening today in Europe is the result of something that happened a long time ago. And, and I find it interesting that all of these debates in Europe where people say, you know, they're coming to Europe. Of course they're coming, because 100 years ago, you went to their continent, didn't ask for permission, right? But, but I mean, it seems to me, I think, I think that, I really do think that that has to be part of the conversation. If we start off talking about migration in a way that makes it seem unbelievable and illogical, it will never work. It is, there's actually an inherent logic, I think, to it. Because you go back, I mean, you, you look at Africa in particular. You know, I'm Nigerian because the British created Nigeria. Um, the, the, the person from the country near mine is, is, is Togolese because the French, and, and the set up structures, and you know, and I keep saying this, that these countries in Africa were not set up to succeed. They were not. You cannot, impose a dictatorship, which is what colonialism was. Because, you know, we, we talk about, oh, the colonial governments, and sometimes it can sound benign. It was not benign. And, and it seems to me strange to expect that countries that were birthed in dictatorships will suddenly flower to democracies. It's going to take a long time. And in that process, people will want to leave because human beings simply want better lives. And they're going to go to the places from which the other people came 100 years ago. It just, it, there's an inherent human logic to it. And, and human history has been a history of movements. And human history, you go back and it's been a history of movements. So what we can talk about is, is 
you know, we can talk about how do we regulate this, how do we, but I don't think we should start off with the premise that it's somehow a crazy logical thing, because it isn't. On va prendre... We will take another question, but I would like to add another fact, maybe as a tribute to your father, who was a statistician. We talked about the migration crisis, but uh, we haven't been recalled of a fact, which is a demographical fact. Western Africa is the region of the world which has the the lowest emigration rate, contrary to the representation that we have of a wave, of a migra migration wave. In fact, is the place where the least people live from this place to go in other countries, in fact, to go in other African countries. So these are things that we uh, need to have in mind because uh, there are in statistics, but we don't hear much from those information from this information in the news. Thank um, you, I did not know that. Alechi Mamanda, thank you very much for coming here. It's over here, sorry, okay. stand up. Um, so thank you very much for coming here and being part of this. Um, I just wanted to find out, question to you, Shay Jawele, what is the meaning or another meaning behind the choice of, um, of title? Oh, um, there really isn't. I, Ijawele is an Igbo name that I've always liked. It's also an unusual Igbo name. And even for some Igbo people, it's difficult to pronounce properly. So I just wanted to use a name that would make things difficult for people. <laughs> that, that really was the only, yeah. <laughs> is that your little girl? Oh. We'll maybe take two other questions. Two other questions. We have to conclude in five minutes from now. Uh, I have a microphone. Il y a quelqu'un qui a un micro, pardon, je vous avais pas vu. Allez-y. Oui, merci beaucoup. Donc, tout d'abord, je tiens à remercier. Many thanks. I would like to thank Chimamanda for being here, here in Geneva, as much as here in this world. For many people here, Chimamanda changed many lives, and at least mine because you put words on our intuitions and translated our struggles, internal and external, into vocabularies that were accessible and accepted and could export in the world. And we thank Chimamanda for describing our situation and making it an evidence, something obvious. And she materialized the fact that a young African woman can be recognized as a maj major literature figure and as an intellectual. And by doing this, it's not just a personal path, it's also the possibility of opening possibles for women like me to think it's possible. The question I would like to ask now, Chimamanda's presence and status seems obvious, but uh, in the world we live in, it's not obvious. Reading and listening your talks entices us into not being naive. And to get to the place where Chimamada is, it must not have been easy. So I would like to know which challenges Chimamanda was faced with, and most importantly, which strategies she took to overcome those challenges. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, I, I love what you said about what's possible. Um, and it means a lot to me. And and I just want you to know it is possible. You know, there is, there is um, I think there's so much talent and, and um, there's so many dreams that sometimes we, we let ourselves hold back because maybe we haven't seen somebody who looks like us who's done it or you know, the world is telling us we can't, but we can, we really can. And um, so when I started writing, I mean, it was, I, I, was, I was 
When I was younger, I was you know, quite smug, and I thought, oh, of course I've written the best thing ever in the world. And so I sent out the manuscript for this novel that I wrote before Purple Hibiscus, and, and it was rejected by everyone. And, <laughs> and I had a very difficult time dealing with rejection initially because I took it very personal. And I would just have these um, spells of depression. And, but I came to see that rejection is part of the territory. When you're rejected, it's not so much, it can in fact be that your work is not very good. It can also be that it's just not the right fit, or that the editor doesn't get it. Or, and, and really, for me, then rejection became, it's been rejected, I'm going to try again. So I would send out, and even when I was trying to get short stories published, I would send out short stories, I would get these form rejection letters, where you just knew that an intern had just looked at it and put it in an envelope and sent it off to you. And then gradually, I started getting the nicer rejections where the editor actually wrote, in the editor's hand. And then I got, acceptances, and, but it was, a, it was a slow progression. And in some ways, I'm happy I went through that because it teaches you that you have to keep going. You know? and, and I did believe, you also have to have confidence. And, and in talking to young women, I, I say this very often, that you have to own your ambition. You know, don't apologize for, for wanting more and for, and for being ambitious. I've been ambitious since I was three years old. You know, I, no, seriously, I wanted to be the class prefect, I wanted to, um, and then when the teacher wouldn't let me hold the cane and beat the noisemakers, I was very upset because I, I wanted to beat the noisemakers. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was the annoying child who, if I got a 95 on a test, I'd be very upset because I was thinking I want to get 100. And it was for me, I wanted to do it for myself. And, and as an adult, I've learned to own that. You know, you, you, you have moments of self-doubt because every human being has that. But you also have to own it. You have to believe that what you're doing is you know, worthwhile. Obviously, you have to do it well, but... <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's learning to understand that rejection is part of the territory, I think. That it, it was a bit difficult for me, but I'm, I think I've mostly learned that now. But also, um, now being this public figure, there are times when I don't want to be a public figure. Um, there are times when it, it's very easy for people to misunderstand you, sometimes deliberately. You know. It's easy for people to give you motivations that are not yours, and it can be very annoying because there's nothing you can do about it. And this is also why I'm not on social media, because I think I'll get into fights every day. <laughs> uh, and so that kind of, it also it comes with the territory. And it, you know, it, but you, you kind of learn to, you kind of learn to selectively ignore things so that you can keep yourself focused on what you want to do. But I just want to say, not just to you, but to, to all the women in this room, we, you know, it's possible we can do more. I think about all the dreams that women have let go of. And I think about how the world would have been had women been allowed to be their full selves. And, and I kind of dream about when that can happen. So if there's any way that my work or my presence can help women do that, I, it, I yes. Can we just, you know what, I'll keep my, I'll keep, I, I promise I will not ramble, I'll keep my answers short, but I do want to hear from, from the people who had their hands up. I'll keep my answers really short. Alors, peut-être un, un, un dernier ensemble de questions comme ça. Maybe one last package of questions. Je uh, vous So my question is, uh, do you, do you consider equality between uh, man and woman a fundamental human right? and how to protect and promote this right in front of religions such as Catholicism or Islam that doesn't consider men and women equal. Because we often say we should change our culture, but we should also say we should change our religion. Yes, but I, I often think of religion as part of culture. And yes, and yes, of course, I think, I think, um, I think the equality of men and women is absolutely human right, absolutely. How do we, I mean, one of the things I've been thinking about lately actually is how to craft a feminism within the religions. I think there are parts of the world that in which religions are so central and so important that you cannot discard religion and so you have to work with religion. And so I um, actually want to, to, to go through a study of the Bible, for example, to find justifications for feminism because I think you can justify anything with the Bible. And... And you think about, you know, you, as Christians, you think about Jesus Christ and you think about the, the regard that Jesus Christ clearly had for women. 
and you start to realize that maybe the way that we have we have structured um, Christianity maybe wasn't what Jesus had in mind. So I think it's entirely possible, really. I really do. And I, I also think I also think that I mean the, the the very interesting and progressive readings of Islam that I have come across, in which again it's not this kind of um, the, the sort of the, the mainstream reading of it, which is that women are inferior, all of that. And so yes, I think that I think I think it's possible. I think that the women who are experts in religion really need to work on crafting feminist um, versions. Of, of those religions. But also remember that, you know, human beings made religion, so we can always remake religion. I just, can I just ask a question? I've got the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, <laughs> I just wanted to get in before the next person did. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Igbo and I'm Nigerian and I, I just wanted to thank you really. It's the first time I have heard in a public place like this the Igbo language spoken outside a non-Igbo audience, and it did wonderful things throughout my whole body and soul. And I just, <laughs> and I just wanted to say thank you. And I, I recorded that bit so I can get my parents to listen to it because it would also touch their souls. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Uh, there's, a, there's a young woman who's had her hand up for a while. Une question devant, là, oui. And another question in front. S'il vous plaît. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, I, as a single mother of two boys, I feel like I have a great responsibility towards my sons to change the perspective they have in my household. But uh, I always had a problem with the word feminism. And I wanted to know if you always had that relationship with the, the word. Because it feels like, it, to me, it implies like we have to prove something that we are, and I live my life as I don't really give to uh, about what people think uh, uh, about, sorry, <laughs> my heart is pounding. <laughs> I'm such a fan. Um, <laughs> so. no, it's, no, I get, you know, and, and I understand, no, I've always been happy with the word feminist. But I also understand people who haven't. I think in particular, there are black women who felt that, that um, Western feminism excluded them. The history of Western feminism was racist. So there were many black women who didn't feel connected to it. And not even just black women, women who were not white didn't feel connected to it. I, I just take the dictionary meaning for, you know, and, but I also think it's important to have a word around which we can all rally. Because I think unless you name a problem, it's difficult to solve it. And there is a problem. And when you say we have, you feel like we have to prove something, yeah, we do. <laughs> you know, that there's a problem that we need to solve. And so I sometimes think that women are a bit uncomfortable with it because it can often come across as too aggressive or men will be put off by it. And my thing is that a man who's going to be put off by that word feminist is probably not the kind of man you want to be with anyway. <laughs> um. Voilà, je, je me permets de me... Uh, I'm ready. I have the microphone too. J'ai le micro, moi aussi. Me too. Wait, where? I'm, I'm, I'm sent here I'm, I'm on, on behalf of uh, an organization called The Blash. So it's an organization uh, for black women oh. in Swiss Germany. And I, I wanted to introduce this uh, um, association because, okay, I'm, I'm not a, a black woman, obviously. <laughs> I'm a transgender, mixed race uh, person. I don't consider myself a male. I consider myself as a non-binary person. But anyways, I'm here on behalf of Blash. So uh, because when a person asked a question about migrants, I, I really wanted to stress the fact that, of course, my, uh, migrants, are, uh, it's really important to talk about migrants, but there are thousands and thousands of children born here and who were born here since a long, long time, who were born black and Swiss. Um, and I think that uh, it's really great that uh, Kimamanda is here and that we get, get to ask her questions, but there are people that are here that can also answer questions. <laughs> um, so 
My, the first organization is called Blash. The second one I wanted to talk about is Afrolit, that is not, I'm not part of, but who was created by a black Genevan woman, who, uh, an association that, that um, pushes um, uh, black authors. So it also exists, you, could, you can also ask them. And the last one is the Alliance Against Racial Profiling, who, which was created also in Bern, so you can also contact them. So I, I wanted to say this, and so sorry for taking this space to, to talk about this, and I, I just wanted to ask you your opinion on, on such organizations, especially on uh, uh, associations like uh, Afro Literature and what you think of, 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 of people of color being, uh, uh, staying together and, 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 and pushing forward um, African and Afro diasporic literature. Thank you. I think that's good. I had a question. Yeah. Um, as a fellow Nigerian lady myself, I'm really proud to be Nigerian today. <laughs> Seeing you on that stage and actually speaking Igbo is very heartfelt. I'm Yoruba. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I just wanted to come back on, I guess, an incident everyone can relate to, which was the famous interview. I grew up in Nigeria. And I, I do remember this one library my grandma used to take me to called Quintessence. But today, my question is, in a world where wax is a trend, Afrobeats is an upcoming trend, how come, um, lit, I would say, African or even Nigerian literary is not up with that? What is your vision for, or how do you see um, African literary taking the stage that it actually should take? What, are, what is your vision for the future? And how do you um, not not maybe how would you be a spokesperson, but more how do you position yourself in, in that path? Um, I actually think that African uh, literature is, is um, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the word trend, but I think it's doing fairly well outside of Africa. I actually think that young people today from the continent who are writing have a much higher possibility of being published and being read seriously today than 20 years ago, much higher. I think I actually think there is a um, there's a kind of upswing, but I mean back to by the way that question. I mean she's referring to an interview I did in Paris in which a woman asked me whether there were bookshops. It was actually bookshops, not libraries, and um, and she said that she'd asked that question because a majority of French people did not know. And so in, increasingly what I'm interested in talking about is that, I mean, if that is in fact a fact, that the idea of bookshops in Nigeria would be news to a majority of French people, that's very disturbing on many levels. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm not really worried for African literature. I think that, I think I'm quite optimistic, yeah. Thank you. My question is about toxic masculinity. So I grew up, well, I've been reading all your books and I like love you, so that's why I'm shaking. <laughs> but um, I developed feminism from reading your books and my ideas about what my womanhood is. But growing up in Ghana, that was constantly challenged by mm. women in my life, mm. by the men in my life, and by society in general. And so reading the, the book, um, Dear Ija Willie, I'm thinking about how I can raise my daughter. I don't have one yet, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, but also, how do, I, how do we raise our sons mm. to be different? Mm. And not necessarily to be different, but to become the new norm mm. that is feminist in its mm. being, mm. even if we don't call it feminism. Mm. Um, I think that there's something maybe you can say about that for me, a young woman who doesn't really have um, a fe an African feminist role model to look mm. at. Mm. Um, that would be very mm. helpful for me. <laughs> Thank you. That's the next thing I'm going to do. <laughs> how to raise a boy. 
So, so for our sister here with her two sons, I mean, I was thinking about that because it's, it's a huge responsibility. You, you, but it's also a necessity that boys have to be raised differently. And I've often said that for me, feminism is not just about women because we can change all the women in the world. And if the men remain unchanged, then nothing has changed because we have to share the planet. <laughs> um, so it's either we change them or we, we round up all the men and, and drown them. No, that's a joke. So, um, joke, please. Nobody write my agent emails, please. Joke. So, <laughs> but, but I think, I mean, I, and I think one of the ways is, is to remake masculinity. Let's make it a different thing. We raise boys now in, to, to value things that are just really, I think, bad for them. You know, I think masculinity is terrible for men. That idea that you always have to be strong, that idea that you don't have the language for your emotions. Um, th there's a sense in which a lot of masculinity is a certain kind of hollow performance. And, and I'm thinking in raising boys, for example, what if we emphasize different things. So that whole idea of saying, boys don't cry, be tough. What if we never said that? What if we expected them from the time that they're eight months old to cry? And actually, what if we shame them for not crying? No, seriously. Because, and, and it will take a critical mass of people, but you can sometimes see the men who are raised by parents who think differently. You can see that they're kind of different, you know? Um, and so things like that, things like, that, that idea that of, of a man always being a protector. I, I think that we need to change that. Because I think what it does is that th there's a kind of internalizing that comes with masculinity. And it worries me because I think you internalize so much and then almost, violence almost becomes inevitable. Yeah. I, I, I would, for example, I don't have a son, obviously. Um, if I did, I don't think I, there would be much of a difference in how I raise my son and my daughter. Which I, and I mean to say that Growing up, I saw how when boys did domestic work, they were praised excessively. When girls did domestic work, it was just seen as, yeah, they're girls. And I see it even now with adults. I would, I would not do that. Um, because I think we need to make it ordinary for boys to think that domestic work is absolutely ordinary and anybody can learn it. I mean, I, I say this all the time. Girls are not born with the ability to do domestic work. They learn it. Anybody can learn it. And the reason I keep harping on domestic work, apart from the fact that I don't like doing domestic work, is because I think it, it's really intertwined with many things. You know, when we talk about can a woman have it all, it's, it's based on that premise that a woman does the domestic work or, or, the, or the sort of the, ch the caregiving. So cleaning, childcare, parent care, the assumption is the woman does it. And so when we start talking about whether she can do it all, what we're saying is when she's done cooking, cleaning, taking care of the child, taking care of the aging parents, can she then have a career? But what if we change that premise? And what if, in fact, caregiving is something that men and women do? Honestly, that, that conversation of can a woman have it all would change. It would change because then a woman wouldn't have to battle dealing with the, you know, the ridiculous pressure of she's doing all the caregiving, she's doing all the housework. You know, she's the one when, who knows where the children's socks are. She's the one who schedules all the children's. I mean, she does every damn thing and then she does her job. And, yeah. Go ahead. Thanks, I have the microphone now. <laughs> battle. Um, we have to have a battle. <laughs> All right, no, no, no. You go first and then you. Thanks so much. There is enough room to share. Thank you. Um, I'm super excited to get to ask this question because I promised my friend I would ask this question. We read your book together. We're all Jamaican. And so I'm super excited about the Haitian that was out there. It was like so cool, like Viva IT. <laughs> it was beyond cool. It was so powerful. It was so Supremely. powerful. <laughs> I'm super happy about it because I learned a lot about um, Pan-Africanism and appreciating the African in you as a Caribbean person, as someone who is kind of separated from the continent, mm -hmm. from the, ha the Haitian brothers and sisters that came to Jamaica after the earthquake in 2010. So I super really appreciated seeing that. Also, your book, Half of a Yellow Sun, was the first uh, black, probably, and African woman novel that I ever read. And so me and my two friends were super excited about it, and we were lost in it. And we had one, and Kainene, for me, 
was like this symbol of feminism that I was kind of uh, aspired to be, like kind of impossible for me to even a dream of at that age. I was like 19, 20 or something like that. Today I feel like super like, I think she'd be proud of me. Um, but I wonder how you conceptualize this character and uh, I was so hard at the end that she kind of disappeared. So I told my friends I would ask about that. <laughs> if you could provide any feedback, that would be great. <laughs> thank you. I thank you. Thank you. I wish I could provide feedback. Sadly, I cannot because I don't know what happened to her. Honestly, I don't know. But I wanted to, in, in, doing, in researching the novel, I came across a number of stories like that. And I think it's the most heartbreaking thing because because when you know you can mourn, but when you don't know, you always have that sliver of hope in your heart. And I think it's just the most heartbreaking thing. And I, I, I read stories about people. I talked to one woman whose son had never come back. She'd never heard of his death. And so and until recently, I mean, the war ended in 1970. But in 2012, she was still going off to towns where somebody had said, we saw somebody who looks like him. And she would go off to look. And, and there's something about it that just broke my heart. And so I wanted to try and capture that, that sense of just not knowing. Uh, yes. My name is... A, no, the, I have the mic. No, she has a mic too. <laughs> At the back first, please. Okay. Yeah. Finally. Um, hi, uh, my hi. name is Caroline. I'm from Rwanda. And I don't think I can thank you enough for gracing us with your presence today. I've read yeah. most of your books and you've inspired me in many ways. And my question for me, for you today is, um, how do we invite or make uh, African men understand the benefits of feminism and how, we can, how it can benefit us, uh, the family, and our countries and continent collectively? Oof. That, that means two things. So I'm Igbo, and Igbo people are known to um, think very highly of money. So one of the things I, I do with my Igbo brothers to try and get them to, I say to them, aren't you tired of always paying for everything? <laughs> <laughs> so that's usually an, an opening thing. I say, well, you shouldn't. And they say, yeah, I really shouldn't. And then I say, but if you shouldn't pay for everything, then there are other things you have to accept. Which is, you know, and then they suddenly they're like, mm. I think, I think, but I, I really increasingly think that we need to sell that. We need to, I mean, feminism has to be, um, because again, if we're thinking not in terms of the theory of it, but the practicality of it, it's really to try and find ways to make it seem not so bad for men. Because part of the reflexive um, resistance to feminism on the part of men is that they think they're losing. Yeah. Right? And, and yes, equality will, will involve a certain loss of privilege, but not necessarily a loss-loss. I mean, I really think that if we lived in a feminist world, men would be better off. And I think in some ways it's to sell it to them in, in sort of, you don't have to be burdened, burdened by all of these expectations of masculinity. You don't have to, um, you know, you can in fact, because I think deep inside many men, they really would like to just be human and to cry. You know, and we need to teach women that it's okay for men to cry. Because that's another thing, I think, that holds men back. Because they think, I can't lose face. And you know, to encourage it, to say, to, to um, reward it, even. <laughs> I mean, there's a part of me that kind of is irritated at having to kind of treat men like children, you know? But <laughs> you do what you have to do. <laughs> and, and Sylvan just spilled his water at that point. <laughs> Okay. Non, c'est juste qu'on me fait des grands signes et je crois que pour des raisons euh, logistiques liées à la suite des événements ici, il faut vraiment qu'on s'arrête. Pour des raisons logistiques, nous devons vraiment s'arrêter ici. Je suis désolé de vous dire ça. Mais je pense que vous tous pour votre attention, pour être ici. Merci, Chimamanda. Merci.